And if all is well, we are live again. And yes, today, today I am quite excited. It's a new project. It's a new thing I wanted to do, absolutely. And today is my first interview in, and this will be going on for the next upcoming weeks. And today I am really excited. Yes, I'm so excited. I can't even find my words anymore to say a normal sentence. But before I introduce my first guest, can I ask those who are already present, please send me a little message so I know that uh, you can hear me well on the Facebook page, because that's always important, of course. And I know, I also know that many of you will see this in the replay, because at this time, it's now 12 p.m. over here in Spain, that means everybody in America is still sleeping. And some in Australia, and certainly those in Europe, are still working. So I know that right life, we won't have so many people, but that doesn't matter because this is being recorded and you can also see the replay on Facebook. So that's the most important thing. Okay, let me see. Oh, I have Julie from Australia. She can hear me. We have Jessica from the UK and Christine from France. And everybody says they can hear me well. So that's good. So I will not keep you in longer in suspense. And I am going to bring in my guest. Hold on. Let's click that little link and he will be showing up soon on this page. Ta-da! And who we have we here? Hold on. He is muted. I've just unmuted you now. So let me, before I let him do all the talking today, let me present this man. This man that I have known for about 10 or 11 years, more or less now. Yep. This is Rob McLaren. Rob McLaren is a happily married man and father of two beautiful young girls. I just saw them the other day. He is also a passionate horseman, lives in Southeast Queensland, and which is more important for today is, he is also the son of Dr. Brian McLaren. He is the former CEO of Advanced Photonic Therapy, and he is now a published author. So, Rob, welcome today. Welcome at this first meeting, at this first interview, in, in, in a bunch of interviews that we are going to do to honor your father and to honor you and the family and everybody who helped bring uh, Photonic Therapy, Photonic Red Light Therapy into the world. It all started with your father, and that is why I want to start with you today. Well, well, thank you very much, Ava. Um, it's a, an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, hello to everybody that's uh, joining us live. And uh, hello to everybody that will be, uh, when they get out of bed or stop working, will, will join us soon. So it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting to be a part of this project. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, uh, uh, I hope it all works out wonderfully well for you. You've, you've worked so hard. Yeah. Anyways, for all those who see this, do not worry. Rob is going to come back in another interview when it was his time that has to do with photonic therapy. He will come back and explain it all at that moment. Today, with the first interview, we are going to go all the way back to when Dr. Brian McLaren was just Brian McLaren, became a vet. But let me start with asking my questions to Rob. Rob. Could you first of all tell us a bit about Brian's background? Uh, how did he grow up to become such a scientist? Uh, certainly, Ava, certainly. Uh, Brian was born just prior to the Second World War um, and he grew up as a little boy on the family dairy farm. Um, at school in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, he was deeply influenced by the scientific breakthroughs that were occurring in the 1920s and 1930s. So it was a very exciting time for science. And as a, as a, young, a, a young boy, uh, he, was, he was very excited by those things and, and wanted to play his part. Um, he was a driven student of veterinary science um, and he was on the crest of that wave known as the Green Revolution in the 1950s and 1960s when society was using more chemicals so that we could grow more food, grow more animals for food, um, and therefore stop the world's hunger that had been known for thousands of years. And so as a young man, he was 
uh, very excited as vets were at that time, they were focused on agricultural production, not so much as we are today, more on pet care management. Um, but yes, how do we make bigger cows, bigger wheat, bigger corn, bigger sheep? Um, this was the exciting projects of that time. And, and he was very excited by that. So um, Brian as a veterinarian was also very excited as an agricultural engineer. He wanted to design things. And many of his, pro his projects prior to photonic therapy were in the design of things. So he found himself participating in exciting projects, both in government, veterinary science, and in veterinary consultancy. So that was sort of what brought him to the point where he, he, uh, he bumps into uh, or starts the, his, his next journey. Yeah, because if I remember well, uh, it was uh, in his 40s when Brian came into contact with traditional Chinese medicine. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, you're, you're absolutely spot on. He was a young man in his 40s. And this was in the late 70s, the late and the, the, through the 1980s that this was occurring. And he was the senior veterinary officer of the animal quarantine department or section of Australia's uh, National Department of Health. So he occupied quite a senior position in quarantine in animals in particular. And here he was involved in the import processes of animal and plant uh, products that were, were products that were used as part of traditional Chinese medicine by the very large Australian Chinese community. So, and at that time, especially a veterinarian in his 40s, he was, Brian held the view, he had a very low opinion of traditional Chinese medicine at that time. And he felt as he was dealing with the import of this animal products, that profit was being created from ignorance and that animal species were being harvested for greed. So he was very anti traditional Chinese medicine, and that led him to his next exciting step. So in the end, as it all changed, what drove him to study acupuncture then? Well, that's a, a great question because in the, eight, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, Brian returned to private practice veterinarian and he was based, and once he'd settled in a very fertile region of Australia's uh, agricultural region, an area known as the Darling Downs. And once he was settled, he, his scientific drive, uh, he sought a new project. Um, and the one that he determined was he was going to disprove acupuncture as a part of traditional Chinese medicine. He was quite excited by this project. He, he was going to disprove acupuncture. Um, and he felt this was going to be easy because he knew that animals have no placebo effect. Um, and so he's, he had a plan, he had a plan, and he was going to study um, acupuncture through the International Veterinary Acupuncture Society. Um, he was going to excel at his studies. He always wanted to excel. He was going to learn Mandarin so that he could speak to people. Um, he was going to become, he said, I'm going to become the president, the president of the International Veterinary Acupuncture Society, and then expose the charlatan, <laughs> hocus pocus, witch doctor, fraud, ha ha, acupuncture. He was going to be the Wizard of Oz, and he was going to show everybody what was behind the curtain. And so he set out on this journey. And um, over now, a three to four, yeah, sorry, and so over a three to, three to four year period, he studies, he becomes fluent in Mandarin, he achieves his International Veterinary Acupuncture Society qualifications, and he applies the knowledge on his animal patients. And they heal, the animals heal. So what was Brian's reaction then when he saw that acupuncture in the end was working on animals? Yes, he was, he was dumbstruck. He, he, how can this be? How can they be healing? He was um, 
he was overawed at the results and amazed at the results, but his scientific foundations, his scientific values were immediately excited. This is, as a scientist, I'm ready to be wrong. This is working. I can see my own observations. How can this be? So he started to search for Western mechanisms or Western insights into their views, any views on acupuncture. And so we need, and he found at that time, this is the early 1990s, that information about China at all, let alone mm-hmm. acupuncture, was very, very scarce. Um, the Western nations had really stopped thinking about China with the, the First World War. After the First World War, China had descended into a civil war. Then the Japanese invaded China. And so there was huge turmoil in this country for such a long time. Um, at the end of the Second World War, China became a communist nation. Mm-hmm. And thus it became the West in 1950s, the Western enemy. And China had only opened up to Western governments in the early 1970s. Uh, In Australia, our prime minister had gone there. We may remember uh, Richard Nixon had gone to visit Mao Zedong. And so in the 1990s, when Brian was doing his research about what views were there, there was very, it was very scarce. Um, And I'll give an example. Mm -hmm. As he studied, he found that the Chinese masters emphasized the ting points. As we know, the ting points are the the points on the fingers and toes. And the Chinese masters, the the Mandarin word is jing, Mm -hmm. and it means the well. This is the source of the meridian and off it would flow from the well. And the Americans had, had... put the word ting because it was easier to say than jing. And we now in the West have ting points, not a jing points. So this was an an example of why, how did Brian find this knowledge, et cetera. And and this example around ting points, for example, he was working with large animals, horses and cattle. And if they were not well, you know, he's down there underneath a cow crush being kicked by stallions and bulls. Um, And so he was fascinated. Uh, Was it possible to be more effective or effective or as effective without a needle? Okay. So that's the reason then that Brian decided I have to find something else than needles. Okay. Yes. And, Hmm. And that's then also the motivation for him to not leave traditional Chinese medicine behind, but to find a new tool, like in the red light therapy, I suppose. Very much so, very much so. Um, he's he's, he's uh, driven by, um, so he's searching now for, for sources about it. And if something else happened at that time, um, it's quite funny to look back now at this sort of history. Um, and, and, and for many of us, it was actually happening in our time. In 1991, when Brian was studying this, the Soviet Union collapsed. Mm -hmm. And in all of the organizations like the KGB and the government and the Department of Agriculture and the Ministry of Defense, all this information flooded out into the the West as the Soviet Union became became Russia. One organization that had a lot of information flood out of it was the Soviet Academy of Science. And in the Soviet preparation for World War III, acknowledging that there were going to be many, many casualties should there be any conflict with the West, the Soviet Academy of Science knew that the West had more drug agencies and the Soviet Union did not. And so the ability to create vast drugs for healing the casualties of World War III wouldn't be there. The Russians are a, that curious blend of European people and Asiatic people. And so there was a general acceptance of acupuncture in Russia in the 70s and 80s. Mm. And so the Soviet Academy of Science was studying what else can stimulate acupuncture points because they weren't, they didn't want to package 
little acupuncture needles made of metal to go out in, in combat packs and, and, and combat hospitals because the steel is better used as ammunition. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Indeed. So, and so the Soviet Academy of Science started to work with a very new, exciting technology called laser, and they found that it wasn't working, that laser wasn't working. And so they were trying to find other ways, and they stumbled across light, and they stumbled across red light. And this was packaged in their information in 1991 and was suddenly available to the world, which was until then top yeah. secret. Um, so, so Brian had received this information. And so he starts to look for light devices. And at that time, in the early 1990s, there were devices emitting the light that the Soviets had described, but they were very, very large and they had lots of power cords and that would, he couldn't use that in a cattle yards or in a horse stables. So he, he knew what the machine could do. He understood its specifications, but the machines that were available, and they were very expensive, thousands, thousands of dollars in the 1990s, very expensive machines. So he, he went to a cousin and his cousin is an electrical engineer. And he says to his cousin, I want a machine that does this, this, and this. It's got to sh just shine a certain frequency of light at this strength. Yeah. And you can imagine the exchange, the cousin says, looks at the note and goes, really, you want that? <laughs> and he says, yes, I know it's going to cost thousands of dollars. It's going to be huge. There's going to be power cords. You want this? Yes. Give me one hour. The cousin goes to the local store. He buys a flashlight, a torch, takes the bulb out, puts a Japanese diode in. And the Japanese had just uh, developed these special diodes that emitted the frequencies that uh, were specified. He put it in, turned it on, and for $10, gave it to Brian. He said, you wanted that frequency at that strength. <laughs> Here is your device. So Brian uh, was amazed at this, the simplicity. And of course he raced out and he used it on his animal patients. And again, it worked. And that's then it drove him further that, that this little red light in his pocket could be, he could get around the, the, the inside of the, um, inside legs of, of stallions and bulls and onto their ting points, um, onto their loins and onto their spine, much safer than before. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a man in his 50s. He doesn't want to get kicked anymore. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, it, so there's that transition to red light. Yeah. The only problem, of course, with that system, because I remember I, somewhere I have the pictures from those very first ones. The yeah. problem, of course, with those was that it was very fragile and, and, and with plastic and everything. So one kick of the horse or one step, everything would have yes. been broken. That's yes. why that this is the first one that I saw uh, or that I also had and where you have stainless steel and then yes. you changed from the diodes uh, to medical chips. And that, of course, made it all more expensive, but a lot safer to use and it couldn't yes. be broken. Now, you were still very young at that moment and you saw your father work at those, developing those red lights and make them stronger and better and, and easier to use. What were you thinking at that time of your father? Did you believe in his dreams or were you thinking, oh, dad, what are you doing now? I, um, the, the I, the, 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 it's a great question. The, the key that, uh, that I observed, and I was at that time uh, in the Australian Army and I was travelling around the country between postings. And I would pass through my parents' home and stay at, for Christmas and those good things. And I was a passionate horseman and my father was sharing this knowledge on how these very simple things I could do with my, with my curry comb. To, to enhance the performance of my horses. Um, well, one of the interesting pieces that, that he expressed to me that I immediately understood as the son of yeah. a veterinarian, of, of a, a, man, a person who'd grown up in a veterinarian's family, was that farmers, the farming families themselves started to ask Brian, 
what are you doing? What are you doing with the light? And Brian would explain. And, and he would explain very well what he was doing. And the farmers then said, well, I've got injuries and my wife has concerns and my family has concerns. And Brian would go, well, there on a horse must be about there on you. So he would then start to treat the farmers and their families. And, um, and the farmers are ringing in the morning saying, I've never had such good sleep. My wife is feeling much better. And I was very aware of the, the professional jealousy that exists between veterinarians and medical doctors. Veterinarians feel that they have, by studying more organisms and more different birds and animals' bodies, that they've had a, a harder a course of study. I've not studied veterinary science or medical science, so I can't uh, wade into that argument. But vets feel that they've done more. Vets don't have insurance uh, for their patients. And when a veterinarian asks their patient, how are you today? All they get is, Mm. <laughs> so, so vets uh, are, are, are a bit funny about medical doctors. And here, instead of treating animals and then waiting for the, 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 the beef sales or the wool check or the, the grain harvest to be paid for, and then the farmer would pay his veterinarian bill, the farmers are bring and the farmer and the sorry and the veterinarian having to go out into the rain and tie a car a, a carving cow to the bull bar of his car and carve a cow in the rain, and we've all seen the James Herriot, uh, all <laughs> creatures great and small sort of freezing cold. Yeah. Um, the farmers were bringing their families to Brian, and they were paying right then and there. So I, as a young man, could see the huge economic change that people were now uh, for him as a veterinarian. So, um, and that was quite a, a fascinating thing. Um, is that what, else? what let's, is that, is that, was that then the moment that let where he started to prepare his transition from being a veterinary surgeon to a photonic therapy professional? Very much so. Um, it, it certainly drove him to, um, it, he began his master's in applied science at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Uh, and in his thesis, he explained um, the mechanisms for acupuncture. So he laid out for the very first time uh, for peer review, uh, what, what he believed at that time is how acupuncture caused that stimulant and his ideas with one or two new discoveries are, are still uh, most valid. He graduated from that in 1996. So therefore, with a master's in applied science, he had the appropriate qualifications to be a photonic therapist for people as well as a acupuncture qualified veterinarian. Um, and the other piece of knowledge that he had was he was utilizing his Mandarin like that example about ting points being originally jing points, he was able to use his mandarin to peel apart the ancient names or the ancient symbology. That's important. We might use a, an English word for ting or jing, but the Chinese character mm. may have had other subtleties. And Brian was able to unpack that ancient code and he could see the, what the masters were originally intending yeah. by expressing fire or, or, or whatever expressions they had um, in that. So he was able to bring more to, no, that point actually does this because that's what the ancient masters were saying. We've simply misinterpreted the word. So he found that quite exciting. And so he was then on that cusp, as you say, for this very exciting transition in around 1996. Wow. Yo. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, I am sure that there are so many people that are, I mean, I see a lot of people already present and I see a lot of uh, remarks, comments being posted. Uh, but I mean, I am sure that many of these people are going to say, I didn't know that. I've never heard of that. Wow. This is, yes. this is really, Rob, this is what touches my heart. This is what I want to obtain is that people get to know what's behind 
red light therapy, photonic red light therapy. And, yes. and for those who still don't remember the difference, red light therapy is the use of a specific red light in this case. But photonic therapy, in photonic therapy, we combine red light therapy and the stimulation of acupuncture points. Yes. So photonic therapy is not just red light therapy. We are a lot more. But yes. it all began with uh, Brian McLaren and him bringing the two sciences that already existed of acupuncture and red light together and yes. making those tools that all of you and we can take care of ourselves and our animals. And this is what I love to hear. What was behind there? How did it all start it? And this is what we need to know so we can share that information uh, with others, hold on, because you've just disappeared from my screen. Okay, you're back. But for all those present, this is only our first interview. Because this series about uh, Dr. Brian McLaren and photonic therapy and so on, we are going to have several interviews and each of them have a specific time frame or a specific function that Brian would have done. So for today, we are just going to Keep it till here. What was before photonic therapy? And in the next meeting, we will start with the McLaren photonic therapy and so on. But let me go for, uh, for a minute uh, and look at those comments. Um, and sadly enough, he won't let me see them all. Hold on. Let me have a look if I can change that. Because I saw some... Uh, some comments also from people that you know personally, Rob. Hold on. Yes. Yeah, I saw that Cleo made, made some comments. But, uh, okay, let's try and see this. No, for one of the other reasons, we have 40 comments, but uh, Facebook is only sharing us the last four. Hold on. Cleo says, Samira sends lots and lots of love as you and your precious father, Brian, saved her life. We are always grateful. God rest his soul. I now own my own farm with 11 horses, goats, dogs, and cats. Please come visit, she says. Yes. <laughs> um, I have Christine here saying, I, felt, I feel immense gratitude to this gentleman and his determination, compassion, and skills. And, and the other 40, because they keep on coming, the comments, but Facebook is not showing them. That's not nice, Facebook. Next time, we will let the people get into the Zoom too, where they can put their comments and we see them in real time. Any, anyways, for all of you here present, thank you very much for having been here for the first interview. I also thank Rob very much with all my heart uh, for wanting to participate in this. And you will see there are other people who knew Dr. Brian McLaren very well, who will be participating in the upcoming interviews. So stay tuned. Rob, the last word is to you. Again, it's, um, it's been a very exciting to see a normal everyday person like Brian McLaren, uh, just like all of ourselves, um, find his passion and all alone in a sort of a, a non-corporate way suddenly bring so much goodness um, to so many people and so many animals. Um, it was a, it's, it's, it's quite um, humbling to think what he was capable of and I suppose what we're all capable of. And, and you, Ava, are, are an example of that, uh, your own determination to do these things. And I think all of the people who have chosen to join us tonight on Facebook um, we, you know, we should take heart from that uh, to say, if, if Ava and Brian can do these things, what can we do? So uh, I think that would be my words of, uh, of, of, in, of his inspiration to us all. Yeah. Well, Rob, thank you. Thank you. Keep following us for the next interviews. Bye-bye. <laughs>